for you French horn players out there. You might know what this is. I'll show you the serial number. Yep, that's a Rauk. So what we are doing on this is just a clean and polish. And then we are going back and finishing the job on this guy. If, let me see if I can get a good angle on it. Someone attempted to take a dent out here and didn't quite finish the job. So we are going to pull this F tuning branch off of here and then do the dent work properly. It's a little out of round here as well. A little narrow and then wide on the height. So we'll get that all straightened out, get this thing put back together, polish it up, and then send it. Morning everybody. So I spent a couple days on this horn, probably about 10 hours in it total and uh, wanted to go ahead and let the footage marinate overnight in my brain. And I'm gonna go through and narrate what I did See, on, this horn. on this horn before. Can't really tell. So right now we're just tearing it down. Slide. I did a right solder on this third it. slide right after the owner purchased it. semi-mechanical linkages. This is my favorite type of linkage on a French horn because you get the benefits of a uh, straight action across this way rather than a traditional rotor which kind of moves like this. So it's less string friction but then you also get the leverage benefits of the string linkage. Nice view of the back of my hand. Go ahead and take the levers off of it. You can kind of see how deep the dent is in that F-tuning branch in this shot. Fourth levers on Geyer style horns are sometimes a mess to put back on. I've got a little trick with a saxophone needle spring and a pin vise. Get the valves out of the horn. Excuse me, my nose itches. or at least the caps off. Don't forget the lever bar, Corey. I like to get as much off of one side of the horn at a time as I can, then flip it over. Try to keep the, the same tools in my hand for as often as, as long as I can. Because every time you set a tool down, you're losing time. So that screw is a little stiff. I ended up chasing the threads on this valve. Had a little bit of a burr in it. And then I have this little punch. Let me go grab it for you guys. This is the tool that I use for removing valves. It's time to remake it. It's about to snap, but it's, uh, you can see the shape of the end of it. The soft brass on most valves, unless they're really in there, uh, doesn't deform the threads or anything. You can see how it's kind of rounded over at this point. Pretty crudely made, but it has served me for 11 years, I think. 
is when this was passed on to me, and it had been used for several years before that. Just a great little tool. So we want to remove as many pieces from the horn as possible. If we left the cork plates on, they would survive the cleaning process just fine, but you get cleaning solution trapped under those, and it can lead to unnecessary corrosion. It also gives us a chance to get the corrosion out of the threads on the screws and everything. And we'll also go ahead and remove the water key and the hand support. That hand support is made by Rauk. It's not like an Alexander that uses one of those tiny little nickel silver balls that seems to crack all the time. A two millimeter screw. Can you see that little ping on the hand guard? Not really there, but you, there's a good shot of it. So I, uh, I ended up doing a little bit of removal on that as well. Uh, even though up here on, or down there on the tuning branch, I say that soldering a pointy rod to it is not the way to remove that. On a hand guard, a little ping like that, they don't fit the branch exactly. And what I ended up doing was they are so thin that I was able to solder a pointy rod to it and pull that dent out and then hollow tap and make it almost disappear. Check out the cloud coming out of this one. It's definitely due to a pointy. Then this brush I got from Kraus. It is really great for cleaning rotary valves. They make two sizes. It does a really good job of cleaning that back thrust bearing surface. And it also does a pretty good job of cleaning up the casing walls. Started out at Palin using the uh, Texas Flush method, which works pretty well. You use a nylon brush and then the, uh, the cleaning solution is pumice hand soap like lava or pumice powder, rotten stone Tripoli mixed with Dawn dish soap to make a slurry and that abrasive action cleans the insides of the slide tubes. Uh, but we switched to brass brushes because we were having troubles with the Texas flush leaving this uh, grayish solution inside the instruments that required us to scrub them twice. And the brass brush is a really nice method because it brass on brass or nickel, the brass is softer than the nickel and the same hardness as the brass, so it's not going to remove material like the Texas flush would, and it does a really nice job of removing leftover scale while burnishing the inside of the slide tubes leaves a really nice surface inside the slide tubes, and you don't have to wash the instrument twice. have various sizes of them for various purposes. We've got 9 sixteenths that wears down to less than a half inch. Uh, sometimes even closer to 3 eighths of an inch that we use for like trumpet lead pipes and stuff. And then we've got the, the fresh 9 sixteenths brushes that usually work well on slide tubes. We've got a 3 quarter inch brush that we use for a lot of trombone bell sections and euphoniums and then one inch brushes for, euph for tubas and euphonium valve casings. It would be nice if they made it in one and a quarter inches because then that would cover pretty much every tuba valve casing that we service. But like on the, the Con short action pistons that are 1.223 inches, uh, we still end up using just a large stiff bristled nylon brush for those. using a snake to get in every curve that we can. Don't want to stick that brush too far in because the, the heads of these pop off pretty easily. You don't want to get a snake stuck inside a French horn slide. It's a nightmare. Stretch out a little bit. 
There's the juice. Saw a little hint of a tie inside the corn. use an impact driver instead of a normal driving drill because the impact drivers tend to have a little more free turning speed. We're not putting too much back drag on them to activate the impact function, so they just freewheel at a couple thousand RPM. And it, the excess, the, the extra speed that we get from them uh, really helps with the expediency of the brushing process. So there we can see the, the brown coming out of the horn. What's great about an ultrasonic cleaner is that it will actually use cavitational action to scrub inside the instrument where you can't reach. Now we're taking the branch off. You can see those business cards that I have. Colin is one of our newest employees and he uh, he had a bunch of business cards from his previous place of employment that he donated to the solder bench. Business cards work really well whenever you have like a contact solder or something that you just need to pull it up a little bit and let it cool off. You don't have to sit there and burn the snot out of your fingers. You just slide that business card under there and it keeps the solder from touching and cooling. Now we'll do some dent work on the branch. These dent balls are graduated in three thousandths of an inch from quarter inch up to three quarter of an inch. I know approximately the size I need, so I'm going through and kind of feeling out what's going to fit. seeing how easily it goes through. So once we get past the, the dent and the bend in the slide, this ball is actually a little too small from what I recall. Yeah. Passes through without stopping. So the ball that I'm using is about two thousandths of an inch smaller than the inside of the, the tube. And so what I will do is, in conjunction with the dent ball, I will use a small steel driver, shake it through. See, I'm shaking it right there. Not using a lot of inertia behind it, but just enough to push the dent ball underneath the dent. And then the primary dent removal itself will come from the hammering action. Uh, you've got your dent ball underneath it and it comes in like this, and you've always got a high spot on the edge of the dent. So our goal is to lower that high spot, and as we lower it, the metal starts to lift off the dent ball, and it is able to slide in the instrument further. Okay. So there's our branch after the dent removal and rough buffing. Dirty. The Removing dents. tooling marks. That brace just now we gotta get it put back together if it would ever stop moving want to make sure that branch lays on there without any clamps everything fits nicely never want to force an instrument together because tension kills resonance so we'll heat from the backside first I applied flux flux is an acid that cleans the surface of the metal uh, solder will not flo flow or stick to a dirty surface and so it has to be as clean as possible that's why we use it and then you saw me heating the backside of the brace, trying to get the backside warmer than the front because solder also follows heat. So we get that backside hot and then keep it warm slash heated up further from the front side. And whenever the solder melts on the front side, it will pull to the backside naturally.
you guys like my shop goblin in the background? Colin drew that for me because I was talking about how whenever I can't, whenever I've misplaced a tool or something, the shop goblin must have got it. And Colin took it and ran with it. And now we have a cartoon of the shop goblin, and I'm not going to be erasing it anytime soon. We've got solder on both sides of that really well. Just a touch more. Notice how I have the, the, the tuning slides in the instrument. I use those to make sure that everything sits where it should. The, the tuning slide you can use as a jig to make sure that your slide tube is lined up properly. And then from there you can see if everything lays on the horn right. And if it doesn't then you need to adjust your tubing however you see that possible. I would probably choose to fill it with bend or some sort of bending media and then re-bend the tube to shape if it was really out of out of place. Just wiping away the excess solder now. I like using pipe cleaners for this because they're excuse me, nice and flexible had breakfast not too long ago. Sorry, y'all. Okay. Mistake. Mistake imminent. I should not have picked up the horn and heated that solder joint trying to clean it up. Because now the weight of the horn, watch, if, if you can see it happen, the weight of the horn will actually pop that branch loose. And a French horn is so thin that it will naturally kind of flex and twist and bend, and you want to assemble the horn as close to playing position as you can get it. Uh, so, okay, so I remember what happened now. I, <laughs> trying to hide my mistake, cut the portion of the video out where I ended up working backwards. One step forward, two steps back. Uh, I picked up the horn, heated up the brace, and it popped loose, and then that flexing of the horn caused the branch to move out of place. So I had to go through and redo my solder. There are no mistakes, only happy accidents. I actually got the branch fitting even better after I had to go and redo it. So what I'm doing here, checking the slide action. So the F tuning slide is a little stiff and just a little bit of inspection made me realize that whenever I took the bell brace off, uh, the, uh, the brace that goes between one of the outer slide tubes to the first branch had heated up a little bit and pulled away from the branch. So what I'm going to do here, watch it, I'm going to reheat it. And see it snap into place right there. Once that is back in place, the slide is fantastic. We got everything lined up properly. We didn't really change the shape of the tubing or anything. I'm going to add a little solder to that brace. Didn't have quite enough in it. A little bit of flux on the surface to make it nice, smooth, and shiny. Adding flux to a solder joint after you have already finished it will smooth out the surface because sometimes when solder cools, uh, it will have kind of a crystalline look to it that's difficult to get a shine from. But if you add flux to the surface of it and remelt just the surface of it with careful heat control, you can get a really fine solder surface that way.
are going to solder the braces between the main and the F tuning slides. I went ahead and took them off. One of the neat things about a Rauk actually, uh, if I have a pin here I'll draw you a little example. Let's see if I can extract this. So H is for Holton, R is for Rauk. So this is backwards, but Holton braces are kind of cup shaped and go maybe about oh, 60 degrees or so around the diameter of the slide. The Rauk actually curves just a little bit past 180 degrees on the tube and so it actually snaps together and holds the tubing in place so you don't have to use, um, you don't have to use solder clips. To hold them together and that the fewer clips you can use the better I know that's backwards but I kind of like this viewpoint so and I know my camera records backwards I can just pretend like I'm looking down at the video so just know that the R on that was backwards Now we'll do a couple of the contact solders. This is going to be a really cool viewpoint. I was telling you that solder follows heat earlier and you can see that capillary action working right here on this solder. So I should have left a uh, Sharpie mark on the branch where the solder terminated. I don't want to add more solder than what was added from the, uh, the workbench that it was built. So I've kind of got an approximate idea of where it goes now. We're going to heat it up first. The reason I'm heating this first is because these really long solders, if you apply the flux, it'll just run to one spot and not clean the surface. It has to boil to truly clean the surface. So I get it warm whenever I have a long solder to do and then apply. But I'm going to apply just a little bit up here at the top of the solder and then I'm going to use gravity in that capillary action and actually pull the solder down. So you see the bead of solder right at the end of the bright blue torch tip and watch it pull down. I'm really glad I got this shot because it's a great example of what I was saying about solder following heat. So I've got one more solder to do down there uh, just south of the belt brace and didn't, didn't put it on this video but here we are putting the belt brace on. I'm not using any clips again because it fits so nicely. But you have to have a really light touch when you're doing it without solder clips. Just get it in there and let pressure hold it in place. Apply flux to it. And then heat and solder. You can see that capillary action working again. <laughs> Don't 
want to get it too hot right here because we don't want to melt the solder around that bell ring. The bell ring acts as a nice heat sink, so it's not too difficult to do without heating up that solder, but still just want to be kind of careful. So we've got everything reassembled. And yes, that is a snare drum stand. We get instruments back from people that have rented them and they just give us the stands back because they don't have any use for a stand if they're returning the drum. And I'll harvest a couple of those a year and use them for ragging French horns just like this. I'm using Flitz polish. This is the, the polishing step on the horn. Uh, getting in between the slide tubes where the buffer can't easily get to or just can't get to at all it has to be done by hand. This part of the process is very time consuming. It takes me a couple hours to go over a horn really thoroughly between the uh, the hand ragging and then the buffing. Hand ragging is about an hour and a half and then the buffing is 30 minutes. We'll go back to a machine buffer. I don't like recording in the buffing room because I don't have a good spot to put the camera, but uh, here is what the buffer can do to a horn. Didn't get too aggressive with it because we're trying to preserve this horn. We don't want to remove any material that we don't have to. tuning slides still out a little bit but you can see the the finish didn't go through try to get all the scratches out of it nice fresh strings and bumpers that are ported properly fresh water key pad you can see especially on the bell flare how I didn't really go after the the minor pitting that is on the metal that will re-patina, and patina actually does kind of protect the surface of the metal. We were just doing so much solder work on this horn, and then I was going to have to buff those areas to clean up the solder that we just decided to start fresh with the patina. Love the Rauk right there. The only, only spot that it says his name. The only other stamping is the serial number on the instrument. So we do have to play test it. So I'm going to sign off here, and we'll let you guys enjoy this little excerpt. Have a great day. <laughs>